Hello and welcome to my channel. Oh, oh crap. Hi, it's Colleen and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be working on the next piece of my 18th century costume, the bum pad. Insert seventh grade butt joke here. <laughs> I like big butts and I cannot lie. Now, you may be wondering why on earth would you tie a pillow around your waist to make your hips and butt look bigger? It's a great question. My hips and butt are already big enough. Thank you very much. But in order to have a really accurate 18th century silhouette, you have to have the right foundation garments underneath the clothes that you're wearing. So throughout history, women have changed the silhouette of their bodies by adding padding, using corsets, different shapes of corsets, different hoops and skirts and supports and bust improvers, <laughs> bustles, crinoline cages, you know, you name it. They would use these things in order to change the shape of their silhouette to match whatever was fashionable at the time. So I'm not going to go into a lot of history about that. I'm going to link a lot of really great resources down below so that you can understand a little bit more about why this piece is so important to the look that I'm going for for the mid to late 18th century. This is going to walk through the process of making this particular bum pad, which is from this pattern. This is Simplicity 8162 and it's by American Duchess. So in my last video, I made the chemise, which is the sort of undershift that you would wear under your stays. This time I'm making the bum pad, which you can see right here. And then my next video, well, couple of videos from now maybe will be on the pair of stays. I've never in my life made a pair of stays so I imagine the process is going to take a little while and I may film some other things in the meantime but I am going to start that project next and we'll see how it goes. This is a great little stash buster project for me. I have everything I need on hand. Some cotton and this is just a scrap of tightly woven white cotton. You have some twill tape that you use as ties to tie it around your waist and then you have fiber fill. So the pattern envelope says that you need to have 10 ounces of fiber fill and I have no idea how much this is, how much it weighs. I've got tons more so if I need more I'll get more, if I don't I'll have less. I have a scale here, it's a digital scale, and I'm going to zero it by putting my colander on top and turning it on. So it will no longer weigh the colander, it just weighs what you put into the colander. So I'm going to start plopping this stuff in there, whoops, and see how much it takes. Oh dear, well, a lot more than this apparently. That's 3.6 ounces and I need 10. This is what 10 ounces of polyfill looks like, and all of it has to go into the bum pad. It seems like an awful lot, but that's what the pattern says, so that's what we're going to go with. I'm using a scrap of fabric that I had. I've got longer pieces, but I just don't see the point in cutting into a longer piece if I have this that'll work. If you recall on the chemise video, I cut a size 20, which is what the pattern envelope said my measurements required. That's way too much ease, way too much. And I thought maybe I could have gone down one size, but when I was editing the video, I realized I probably could have gone down two sizes. So even though I cut size 20 for the chemise, I'm going to do a size 16 on the bum pad, and I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. That would be this piece here, and then you do the piece on the other side where the other fold is, and then I can squeeze out my ruffles from the remainder of the fabric here. I can do two, and then I can piece a third with what's left. This is one of my favorite hacks. These are giant washers from the hardware store, and they work great as pattern weights. I do have some of the commercially available pattern weights that I bought before I knew I could use something else. So these are fine, but these are cheap and they work wonderfully. That's the main body of the bump pad cut out and marked. I'll set that aside for now. Now I need to cut the ruffles. This is riveting content, I know. And actually, you know what would be easier? I don't need this pattern piece after all. So it's four inches wide. And if I know I need three of these, I'm just going to cut four inch wide strips as much as I can get out of here and then measure them. What well, do they say? Work smarter, not harder. I'm going to do that. Okay, so I'll get this all lined up. I'm going to measure four inches with my cutting ruler. Yeah. Let's see who's smart. I'm smart.
That's the outside. And there's the inside. In the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking, they do have a listing of different hand sewing stitches that you can use in the book to be historically accurate on the items that are in here like petticoats and aprons and things like that. This is a ruffle and it says to narrow hem the edge. Here is a narrow hem instruction to fold up an eighth of an inch and baste it down and then fold that folded part in half again so you end up with sixteenth of an inch that you just stitch into place. I don't think I can baste this entire ruffle by hand and then go through and sew it by hand. I'd have to probably break that into two days because of my wrist issues. It's very hard to get an eighth of an inch. It's very, very, very tiny. So basically that's an eighth of an inch right there. And then that needs to be folded in half again. So that puts you very small, but it's still not a sixteenth of an inch. It's still an eighth of an inch. I can't, I don't know if I can do this quite as finely as what the book calls for. Oh, it's so tempting to just do this on the machine using a rolled hem foot. <laughs> I may then stitch that on the machine with a basting stitch in like pink or something. I'll find a color that I'm almost out of and use it up. Um, and then I can roll it again. I'm not going to bother trying to fold that in half. That's ridiculous. Roll that up again and that'll be narrow enough for me. I realized almost too late that you should only put that brightly colored thread in your bobbin. So on the other side you can see it's white and on this side you can see it's the green. So if I'm turning it up this way then I'll be able to see that green and pull it out and the white thread can just stay in there because it's a white fabric. If I had done it with both of them green, I would have had a green line potentially showing through this fabric. So anyway, long stitch length, low tension, and a contrasting bobbin thread. So now I can just roll that right over very easily and stitch it down. Sewing this down is a lot like all my other felling jobs. It's, you know, a similar stitch, but you're not felling down one seam allowance over another. You're simply just hemming it. But man, this is the tiniest little fold I think I've ever hemmed. It is kind of slow going, but I think I'll be happy with it in the end. That's how it looks from the outside. And that's how it looks from the inside. And once I get done, I will remove this green basting thread. Is this overkill for a ruffle, for a bum pad that will never be seen by anyone but me? Why, yes, yes it is. But I'm thinking that this is the same kind of technique you would use on the edge of, say, a fichu or a cap or... Um, you know, an apron or something like that, that would be seen. So I figure why not practice on something? You know, I'll, I'll learn on this. My imperfections will be here. And by the time I get to the end of it, I'll be better at this than I was at the beginning of it. Right? So when I do go on to something that is more visible, I can do a better job of it, but this is going pretty darn well. So those red spots are a mystery that has been hanging around for about two months and I saw them show up on another project and could not figure out where they came from. So here they are again and I finally figured out what it is and I'm absolutely blown away. I'll show you. These red stripes are bleeding. I have had this ironing board cover for years and now I'm seeing all these bleeding spots and I never noticed them before. But that's what's been showing up on my projects. And it's not every project, but it's happened a couple times and that is clearly what it is. So I have a new ironing board cover coming tomorrow. But man, I can't believe that. Why would you make an ironing board cover with dyes that won't last with heat and steam? I just don't get it. 
It's a couple days later and I have finished this narrow hem on the edges of this ruffle piece and I did end up doing it all by hand and I'm so happy I did. It just looks really great. It's an even eighth of an inch and the stitches are just wonderful and neat and it just makes me really really happy and it didn't take too terribly long. I thought it would take a lot longer than it did. So now what I need to do is put in my two rows of gathering stitches on the other side of the ruffle so that I can gather it up to fit. And I'm using a trick I saw, I think on Morgan Donner's page, where you thread two needles and you put them through at the same time. Basically, you hold them in your hand as if it were one needle and you do your gathering stitches that way. So I'm gonna go ahead and show that here. It's still pretty new to me, so it's not gonna be perfect, but the little bit I did worked very well. And I can see that that would be quick and easy. So it's all about getting those needles just situated right. And then you can just work your way through. And that's such a simple, easy thing to do. And I don't know that I've ever seen anybody else do that but her. So, and then you get to the edge, you pull them through just like you would. Just make sure you have nice long uh, tails and work your way through that way. So. I think the trick is just keeping even tension and keeping those needles somewhat parallel. We'll see if any, we'll see if any of this footage is actually usable. I might just say, and now I put two rows of gathering stitches in and not really talk about how I did it. That might be what I do. do it that way again but maybe on a shorter piece so the two needles was good and quick and easy but it's an awfully long piece to do that on so now what I did was I measured the edge of the bump pad to see how much ruffle I needed and I gathered up my string to that length and you can see how nice and neat they are but I'm just distributing that fullness along the length so that they're even and I'm just kind of lightly steaming over the top of them to get them to lay a little flatter and then I'll just make it easier to install the ruffle on the bump pad. I'm going to go ahead and base this ruffle on and then assemble the other side to it off camera because it's just basically sandwiching the pieces together and turning them right side out. Now it's time to stuff the bump pad with all of that polyfill I measured out earlier. It seems like it's way too much, but the pattern called for 10 ounces and I measured 10 ounces. Um, the pattern also says don't overfill it and my goodness that's quite a butt right there. You know I can always just stop when I think I have enough but in the meantime I want to show you these are absolutely delicious. I got them for Christmas they were in my Christmas stocking. I just want to make sure that they're actually in focus. Oh my goodness they're so good. I kind of forgot about them and so I have a lot left. See? Oh, they're so good. So I've been enjoying them while I'm working today. I'm going to go ahead and start working on stuffing this and we will check back in a minute to see just how big it is. It's going to be huge. Huge. Before I put the rest of the stuffing in here only to have to take it out, I'm going to go ahead and give it a quick check. I probably used about 60% of the filling that it said to use. I just honestly can't see putting anything else in here. It would be to ridiculous proportions. So if it's too little, it's easy enough to just undo the stitches and put in a little more stuffing, but I would rather do that than overfill it and be unhappy from the get-go. So I'm going to just whip stitch this closed and I'll give you my final thoughts on this project. There you go, that's the finished bum pad. And you can see on my dress form, it is stunning. <laughs> it's quite big. It looks a little strange, it certainly does. It looks really big and I think for a modern sensibility, this is the last thing we wanna do, right? When we're dressing our clothes today, the last thing you wanna do is emphasize the biggest area of your body. 
by making it even bigger. But I can't think like someone in 2021, I need to think like someone in the 18th century. So this would have been absolutely an essential piece of the silhouette. Now, once I make a couple of petticoats and the out outer skirt, probably three layers of fabric, this will get you know mushed down or weighed down quite a bit. Um, if we look at it in silhouette here, if I push that down, you can see that that'll you know, lay a little flatter and that'll be okay. In the meantime, that's quite a lot of junk in the trunk. <laughs> and the bonus is if you get tired while you're costuming, you can just take it off and take a nap. This chair is so noisy. I think I need to either get a new chair or oil it. We won't get the full effect of this until it's got a pair of stays and some skirts and a jacket to put the whole look together. So stay tuned for that. Those will be my upcoming videos. I imagine by the time I get done, I'll have six or seven videos in this series on the costume that I'm building from the skin out. But anyway, thanks for joining me today. If you have any questions, ask them down below. Don't forget to subscribe if you like what you see here. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing and follow me on Instagram so you can stay up to date on what's coming next for my channel. Thanks and have a great day.